Hello. Hey. Um, so, yeah, I kind of wanted to give a different talk about some other stuff, but that wasn't ready, and so this is kind of a, a makeup talk. Uh, it's been some years since Node came out, and it's kind of stabilized, and it's a thing, and um, it's kind of going in its direction. Um, so I thought I would kind of look back on it and, and uh, tell you what I think about uh, Node. Um, so, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Excuse my wavering voice. Uh, so, right, some background. I created Node and managed it through its initial development for a couple of years. Um, and my goal, as you may know, that was really around uh, I.O. and uh, evented doing, doing event-driven I.O. in JavaScript. And I think that focus was really important in 2009 for getting server-side JavaScript off the ground. Uh, because, as we know now, JavaScript is single-threaded, and like, oh, I'm sorry, uh, and uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. Yeah, JavaScript is single-threaded, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that allowed uh, Node to succeed. Um, so, right, when I left in 2012, um, I feel like Node was more or less doing well in the I.O. department. Um, like, we had protocols supported, like HTTP and HTTPS, and uh, after a massive effort, we ported Node to Windows using, like, very nice system calls called IOCP, and we were running on Linux and Mac, and it had a relatively small core. I mean, it kind of got out of hand a little bit, but it was okay. Um, and it has somewhat stable API, and NPM was out, and there were people adding modules. I was like, this project is done now. Um, <laughs> so wrong. Uh, <laughs> so right, I mean, obviously, this is, this is a, a tremendous effort to, to keep Node running on everybody's machines as it does today and keep it updated with JavaScript and uh, you know, fix uh, the issues with it. And many people have uh, been involved in this effort. Many of them are here. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm probably leaving out many important people. Um, <clears throat> so I personally uh, was kind of done with Node and uh, went on to do other things. Um, and it's only really in the last six months that I've started using it heavily again, um, largely because uh, Go came out, and I was interested in servers and doing fast servers, and uh, Go is a better language for doing fast servers. And so there was no need for me to, to be using Node. Um, but I think actually Node is quite nice. I, JavaScript is really quite nice. Um, in particular, uh, dynamic languages are very nice. Uh, and they're nice for certain things, I should say. Uh, I think if you're building a server and you want to really control every aspect of it, absolutely, you want it to be statically typed. But in scientific computing, for example, uh, there's a lot of kind of one-off calculations where you're just kind of you know, typing into a Jupyter notebook and you really don't want to hit a type error at that point. You're just trying to plot something, right? There is a time and place for dynamic languages. Prototyping things is another situation. Like, you want to move very fast. You don't want to worry about what the abstractions are. You just want to be dynamic. And JavaScript, obviously, I mean, maybe there's many people that don't agree, but here they do. It is the best dynamic language. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> right, using Node is uh, kind of like nails on chalkboard to me. At, at times, just because um, I see the bugs that I introduced that aren't really bugs at this point, they're just how it works, but they are bugs. Um, and they were design mistakes made that just cannot be corrected now because there's so much software that uses it. Um, and it's, it's uh, I don't know, it offends my sensibilities. Uh, it could have been much nicer. So uh, one regret would be that 
I didn't stick with promises. Uh, so promises were added very early, and I foolishly removed them uh, not very long after with the idea that we should be minimal and promises introduce an extra object into every callback. Um, and I can see my reasoning at the time, but had that gone differently, it might have made the ecosystem around building async await stuff uh, happen faster. Uh, unclear. It's an alternate history that we'll never know. Uh, Maybe it was a good thing that promises were removed because it allowed the ecosystem to kind of develop their own tools and we found the right abstraction. Um, but I have often thought that I wish I had left that in. That was a rash decision. Um, did I say all of this? Mm, yeah. Um, another regret is security because JavaScript is a very secure sandbox unlike Python, right? Um, and unfortunately, in Node, we just bound to everything and there's zero security, right? You run a Node program, you have access to all sorts of system calls, and that was really a uh, missed opportunity to be able to make a uh, server-side runtime that could potentially be secure in certain situations. Obviously, if you want to you know, give access to the disk, then people are going to be able to exploit the disk, but there are certain situations where you want to run a program outside of the web browser, but you don't necessarily want it to be able to write to the disk or access the network, right? For example, a linter. It would be nice for me to be able to download the massive code base that ESLint is and run that without having to worry about it taking over my computer, which it could. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, probably the biggest regret is the build system. It's such a pain. Uh, build systems are very, very difficult and very, very important to building projects. Node uses this thing called JIP. Do you guys know JIP? Some of you. If you're writing a module that does, that links to a C library, you use this thing called JIP to compile that C library uh, and link it into Node, right? Um, JIP is this thing that Chrome used to use, and, but Chrome uh, like abandoned JIP for this other tool called GN uh, several years later. Uh, we couldn't have predicted that, uh, but uh, that's what happened. Um, and now it's been many years since that happened, uh, and Node is the sole user of JIP. It's a very funky, interface, it's like a JSON file, but it's in Python. Uh, it's, it's very terrible. Node has several wrappers around this. One of them's called Node JIP. It just layers upon layers of unnecessary complexity. V8 doesn't build with JIP anymore. It has a JIP wrapper to support Node, but I mean, there's just so much unnecessary complexity there. And yeah, frankly, I'm, uh, I think this is one of the biggest failures of the Node technical leadership. Uh, it should be dealt with. Uh, so I think, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure which direction would be the right way to go at this point. Um, it's a difficult problem. There's a lot of software to support. But uh, I do think that I kind of made a uh, not kind of rash decision in thinking that everybody should compile their extension modules. Uh, we could have gone with a foreign function interface, which doesn't require any compiling necessarily, although you still have to have your dependencies there. Um, but I think this could have been a much more natural and uh, easy interface for people who want to link to system libraries. And many people suggested this to me, uh, namely Brian Cantrell, but I totally ignored them. Um, and yeah, LibUV uh, moved to auto tools, which is just unacceptable and regrettable. Uh, you know who you are. Um, I didn't do that. That's a regret <laughs> for somebody else. Um, so, uh, right, another thing, package JSON. Package JSON is like the lifeblood of, of JavaScript at this point. Um, but, you know, at some point it wasn't, and Isaac uh, of NPM fame uh, 
more or less defined it, although there might have been some sort of uh, specification. And I largely sanctioned it and made it popular by allowing uh, require in Node semantics to look into package JSON and look through files. Um, so this makes package JSON basically necessary for, for programs, for, for Node programs, where it, it was not before. Um, and then ultimately, I included NPM into Node, which made NPM the standard uh, uh, Node distribution service. And um, yeah. So I have this problem with this is a little abstract, but in your, in your JavaScript program, right, if you require some module, uh, that doesn't completely specify what that module is. It also needs to be defined in your package JSON that's part of the module resolution algorithm, uh, like which version it is and whatnot, um, in order to install it. Um, and you also have this node modules folder, which does the module resolution. Um, so, you know, kind of linking to a package requires a lot of systems here, uh, a lot of components that uh, is not, oh, what's that? <laughs> iCloud, ugh. All right. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, a package JSON, I think the, my, the problem I have with it is that it gives this rise to a concept of a module as this directory of files where that wasn't really a concept before. Like, we just had JavaScript files. Like, on the web, you just have JavaScript files, and you can, you know, script tag include them all over the place. There's no, like, thing. Uh, there's no, like, module package as there is in NPM. It's not a strictly necessary abstraction. Um, and package JSON just has like all this unnecessary noise in it, like license, repository. It's like, why am I filling this out? Like, I feel like a bookkeeper or something. Like, this is just unnecessary stuff to do when all I'm trying to do is link to a library. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll get to relative URLs. And of course, uh, node modules get very big because it, it kind of has this vendoring by default semantics where modules are installed, installed locally into your, into your project folder. And so you tend to have, if you have multiple projects, you have multiple node modules folders, and it gets big. This was my idea. I regret it. Uh, it this, this, the whole algorithm for resolving module names is just wildly complex. It's, it's kind of been added to over time in ways that uh, are, yeah, regrettable. Uh, I feel like, you know, the vendored by default uh, idea behind node modules, which, which is what I was going for there, was ki kind of had good intentions, right? That we know exactly what we're linking to. It was supposed to be explicit. But in practice, like a node path type thing, a Python path type thing would have would have worked, right? You can do vendoring that way, too. You just set an environmental variable. Um, it just it deviates greatly from how browsers do stuff. And it's my fault, and I'm very sorry. And unfortunately, it's impossible to in undo now. Um, also, this whole thing where you don't include the extension in the, in the require module. Why? Uh, it's like needlessly non-explicit. You now have to like probe the file system for different things. Did you mean .js? Did you mean .ts? Did you mean dot .blah blah blah? Like no, just write the the, the extension in there. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm glad that you guys agree with me because there is still some debate about this this stuff. Um, <clears throat> people like the 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 extension list thing. It's cleaner. Like no. Uh, yeah, said all that. Also, index.js. I'm sorry. OK, I thought it was cute. There's index HTML. I thought it would be cute for, like, you know, when you include a directory, it would look up the index, the index.js. Sorry. This was, like, needlessly introduced. Uh, what I've come to learn now that I'm aging is that, like, whenever you're designing a program, like, there's things that you think might be cute to add in. 
you always regret those. If they are, if they are unnecessary and simply cute, like, don't do them. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, my, my problems with Node are not so much around the I.O. And I, honestly, I, I like Node. I like programming in it. I think it's, it's relatively nice. It's, it's Unix-y. Um, but it's, uh, my problems are more to do with the module system and how it manages user code. And I think this is largely because when I was making Node, like, it was very focused on getting this I.O. stuff. I was, like, nerding out hardcore on, like, ePoll and kind of, yeah, I mean, the, the module system was essentially an afterthought that got added on as users needed this stuff and it is reflected in, the, in how Node works now. Um, so, yeah, with that in mind, um, I was, you know, writing up this talk and it seemed very negative and I thought, like, eh, this is kind of shitty to, like, come up in front of people and, like, complain about stuff without, like, giving, you know, I feel like you should offer some sort of solution or, like, at least a prototype of how things might be differently or how, like, Node might be differently if you designed it today. Um, and all I'll say is that, like, don't try out this code. It's, it's very, very unusable at, at this moment. It does not do anything. And unless you are well-versed in LDB, LLDB, uh, you should not try, bother, try building it. But that said, um, you might want to check out Deno is uh, a secure TypeScript runtime on V8. Working on the tagline, not, sh not so sure about that. Uh, so this is a new piece of software. Uh, it's one month old. But let me, let me, this is just kind of me riffing on what I think would be a nice server-side JavaScript runtime these days. Obviously, evented I.O. is taken for granted. Yes, obviously we want to do that. We have to do that. What else is important? Um, so for one, security. Uh, it would be nice to utilize the fact that JavaScript is a secure sandbox. By default, a script should run without any network or file system write access, and that users can then opt into various access. So if you want to allow it to access the network, you do dash dash allow net, right? And so this allows people in some situations where you have, and I think this is more common than you might realize, you have some code that you just want to run without giving it any sort of uh, without giving it much access to the system that you're running on. And uh, this allows you to do that via uh, the, the fact that JavaScript is a, is a runtime. We just don't bind, we don't allow the, the, uh, the system to reach into the operating system. We don't allow V8 to run, reach into the operating system. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and uh, I don't allow arbitrary native functions to be bound into V8. All system calls are done through message passing, so there's a single entry point in and out of the VM, unlike Node, where it's just bound all over the place, and it's very difficult to keep track of what is happening because there's no single entry point. And this has caused a lot of uh, problems when trying to do things like domains. Uh, and OK, so there's, there's this way of like sending messages back and forth. So inside the V8 that you get, there's only really two native functions. There's send and receive. Receive takes a callback. Send sends a message. Um, and I think I've always uh, thought for many years that like, having this sort of message passing thing would have been nice in Node. Um, and so here's, here's like a vague uh, description of, of what it is. So you have like the deno process, which is written in Go at the moment, although I'm, I'm debating on whether that's the right choice. Um, and uh, you have v V8 running there inside of it. And uh, there's the send and receive uh, uh, calls that are, that are bound into V8. And it can send and receive protobuf messages, right? They're just buffer arrays, uh, array buffers. And um, there's a dispatcher that kind of like sends out messages uh, to various different modules. So these, these modules can kind of, on both sides of the kind of privileged and unprivileged boundary, kind of sync up and and you know the go side can handle the system calls and and turn you know your your request for a set timeout into into a sleep or whatever and uh in v8 you have a similar module system inside of v8 itself uh you have the, the typescript compiler actually like built into the this whole executable i love typescript it is the best thing it is microsoft 
uh, I don't actually know the people who did uh, this work at, at Microsoft, but man, it is very pragmatic and well done and approachable. And I just love the fact that you can you know, start hacking in normal JavaScript and just slowly kind of build your project up. Uh, this was kind of one of the goals of uh, uh, Dart. Uh, do you guys know Dart? Yeah. Total failure. Like, Jesus. Uh, I mean, very good intentions and very cool, but, but obviously a failure at this point. And TypeScript took a totally different approach to the problem and uh, worked completely in JavaScript and uh, I think it, you know, solved it in a way that uh, is satisfying many people. Uh, so if you have not been using TypeScript, like, please check it out. Uh, I want this thing to do TypeScript because I like it. Um, yeah, and so also, uh, Deno, I want to simplify the module system. So screw all this stuff about uh, you know, how node modules work and that. Like, but by the way, I can't be compatible with Node. Like, otherwise, like, you just end up building Node. So there's no attempt at ca compatibility with existing software. Um, this is mostly just a thought experiment, right? But I think it would be cute if you just import via where the source code came from, as you do in the web, right? There's a source file there. You link to that source file, and now you've linked it into your program. If it's a relative include, you do a relative include. Um, obviously, you should provide an extension. And then you might be wondering, well, I don't want this source code like changing out from under me. This seems fishy. Uh, well, it won't. So the first time you do this, if you don't have that URL loaded, then it downloads it, and it caches it somewhere. Uh, and then it never, it never updates that again. When you run it again, it's, it's still using the same code. However, you can do a dash dash reload as you do in the web browser when you, that's my control R uh, <laughs> hand signal, you know. Um, so you can do dash dash reload, and it has a similar semantics where it'll, it'll then do like a hard reload of all the cache files. Um, and yeah, you can do vendoring and stuff by giving it a different place where it downloads these, these files. I think this is viable. Um, <laughs> TypeScript compiler built into it, blah, blah, blah. I already said that. Uh, Deno hooks into, mm, mm, yeah, so I mean, basically, TypeScript should, should work out of the box. And obviously, JavaScript should still work out of the box. But that's trivial because, uh, you know, TypeScript is a superset of, of JavaScript. And um, yeah, at the moment, its startup time is, is quite slow. It's like at one second, which is completely unacceptable. However, I, I am working on uh, using V8 snapshots to snapshot the entire compiler. And I am, the, plus other optimizations that haven't been done, I'm fairly confident that it can be improved greatly. Um, and so Deno also, I, I don't like shipping all of these files. I hate that. I think it should be a single executable. So it should be an executable that doesn't link to too many things, right? So you can just download this executable and run it. Um, and yeah, just generally take advantage of the fact that we're in the future now and like things are great. So for example, in the build process in Node, there's this very complicated setup of like kind of defining require and we have all these files and we have to build them into a bundle, blah, blah, blah. We have to load them all into the V8. But now we have parcel, which is really great, by the way. Um, so what I can do is I can write kind of a normal node program structure for the internal systems of Deno. And then I can run parcel on it, compile it into a single thing, use it, and that will use you know, node's module resolution scheme and stuff. But now I have a, a single bundled uh, JavaScript file, and I can just dump that into V8. So that makes like, the whole process of building this thing much simpler. Uh, yeah, and uh, great infrastructure exists now in native code, right? Part of Node was like writing a web server. Like we spent a lot of time on the HTTP parser. Like you know, there's no need to do that. Like that's all done at this point. You can, if this ends up being Go, then you just link into Go's HTTP routines, which are which are super good. Or you know, maybe I'll use Rust or C++. In either situation, there are. Uh, easy ways to link into uh, high-level code, high-level native code these days. Uh, and I think that that really eases 
uh, the, the job of, of this thing. Um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, and some miscellaneous things like just die immediately when you have an unhandled promise. I mean, like who, who has ever wanted to like, oh, maybe I'll add a, a catch handler later, like, and I don't want this to die immediately. No, like it should die as soon as it gets an error. Uh, should support top level await. I haven't got it working yet, but it's not hard. And uh, yeah, be browser compatible, like in Node, like, uh, you know, I, I, I remember thinking, like, window is a really dumb variable name for the global scope. Like, why call it window? It's, it's not a window. It should be called global. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, that, was, that was a mistake, because now we have this whole, like, incompatibility issue with the browser. So, like, where Deno will overlap with the browser, it should be, it should use the browser semantics, the browser variable names, the browser functions and whatnot. So yeah, check it out maybe. I don't know. It's a prototype. It was just, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm mildly happy with it so far. Um, yeah, uh, if you have any comments or questions, I guess you can't ask them me now, but please email me. And yeah, uh, I don't know. First person to implement an HTTP server gets a star. Um, th this is them out of my talk. I don't. Uh, I still have three minutes left, so thanks. Thanks for having me here.